Okay, so our final lecture of the school is finished by uh, quantum algorithm developer from Pascal Igor Sokolov. Uh, and if this will be the lecture on practical application of quantum machine learning. So Igor, I'm giving you the board. Uh, thanks a lot, Anton. Let me share my screen and let's check if uh, everything works. So uh, you should be able to see everything. Yeah. Great. I guess it's always fun. Um, yeah. So uh, thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. Of course, even to to give a second lecture. Um, so I gave one on variational quantum algorithms, and now I'm gonna talk more about uh, my work at Pascal. So the methods I'm using. Um, every day and what are the applications in this industrial application we are we are working on and yeah it, it was uh, for me personally pretty much of a switch from working only on chemistry problems to more of a general quantum machine learning side of things so um first i wanted to give again an introduction for people maybe who were not there the first time just uh, just a quick one so i was uh, basically yes yeah, so i i would uh, I could possibly do uh, the lecture in uh, Ukrainian or in Russian, but uh, unfortunately, every second word will be in English because I don't know any mathematical terms in uh, in, in our language. So yeah, have to be in English. And uh, yeah, so I did my. I came from Ukraine, Kharkiv. Uh, um, the, from the other Russian speaking side, and uh, I, I came to Switzerland, and I studied in Switzerland for my bachelor's and master's degree in, in Lausanne and Zurich. Uh, all in physics and finally uh, by luck I was interested in chemistry and I found an internship in uh, basically in EMPA a, um, uh, an organization that studies material science um, and there I, I met uh, all the people from IBM that uh, yeah that were working on quantum chemistry on quantum computers so it was by sheer luck. I actually ended up in IBM Zurich uh, doing my PhD. So it was just by curiosity. So I really something I would want to say to you, um, yeah, as as students or not. I mean, not just just follow your interest. In maybe you just make your own luck in the end. And I was very happy to uh, to work there um, and on the chemistry problems, as I discussed in pre previous lecture. And now I'm with Pascal, so I'm more. Uh, uh, doing general uh, quantum machine learning not only for chemistry now and yes yeah, so um, saying uh, maybe that it's uh, you can, can you can check our career page and contact me if you uh, if you feel interested in what we are doing have this email of mine and um, yeah so just to uh, quickly introduce our company so it was it has very good uh, founders so uh, there is a, a nobel prize winner uh, last year on aspe and uh, yeah, there are many people like George, George, uh, George um, Raymond that founded the company that also f uh, trapped uh, single atom and optical tweezer, a uh, very important publication in Nature and other works where we demonstrated quantum uh, supremacy um, in 2021, but not for the industrial relevant case, although it was uh, quite uh, spectacular. And since then in 2022, basically we merged. So uh, there was a merger between Q and Co and uh, and pascal so i was meant to be joining q and co but then since it was merging with pascal it was it was really great because q and, with q and co we were also only spe specializing in algorithm and now we were having basically also developing the actual hardware uh, so now we have a lot of clients uh, our people are very experienced in the topic and we we have uh, we we can basically have very large number of qubits to, from 300, and we have a clear, we have a clear path to scale it up to uh, 10,000 um, with uh, specific methods, and uh, yeah, large number of employees. Now we've grown so much; we are almost experienced. We have a new person every week, so we are hiring uh, quite a lot. It's a bit slowing down now, but it was really incredible how we expanded. We had a very successful finding round. And now we are pushing also for filing patents or not only publication, but also patenting first. And yeah, so we are really a full stack company. We do everything from coding. So we basically work on, uh, yeah, from uh, talking to clients with our already developed algorithms in machine learning, particularly we uh, have a strong uh, background in solving differential equation with uh, quantum machine learning. 
in uh, yeah optimization and simulations for be it for yeah for chemistry or uh, some combinatorial problems and yeah we also have a team in paris uh, paris massi that develops uh, quantum hardware for everything from electronics control uh, uh, trapping of the atoms uh, yeah basically the whole lots um, quite a lot of big customers already joining us to to test our device to see what we're capable of and we try to also uh, as uh, other competitors are doing so uh, basically have this uh, web interfaces uh, such as this Pulsar studio which you can actually try it there is uh, if you have a um, university at university email address or something not uh, um, uh, that is gmail or uh, very popular ones it's not blocked by the system so you can you i suggest you can try and uh, google pulsar studio and uh, you can really play with all the parameters main parameters of your of our quantum computer and uh, make operations on our uh, devices etc so yeah, we device looks like this, yeah, a box. And um, now I want to talk about more in details about the the actual device. Just to, as a, as I mentioned in previous lecture, so basically we are selecting some kind of a, a specific atom that are have particular energy level that we can uh, we can address easily with our lasers and also that that interact well in between and we can control this interaction so we chose this uh, Rydberg uh, atoms like such as rubidium strontium ytterbium and we're basically shining a laser light on it with uh, uh, on the optical table with many elements we basically sh here modulating especially our laser to have a certain pattern in space where we load our uh, selected species of atoms and then we can uh, have a specific algorithm that will um, basically rearrange them in the pattern we'd like so the register shape and then we will apply uh, other uh, lasers to control locally or globally the whole uh, register and then and then we will measure with our camera take a take a snapshot of our device to measure the state and the occupation of every initial atom well, that's what it looks like um and uh, yeah we can as you see do very specific shapes uh, and uh, these shapes of course will depend on your quantum algorithm so um you can you can design a, a better or, more, or better or worse uh, register shape for given problems so that's something you should one should optimize on our device uh the basically the, the register and of course every time as you measure so if you, if you if you look at your uh, occupation number of your neutral atoms you measure the state uh, then you will need to re-prepare, so you need to reload the traps. So um, one needs to always think about uh, how to minimize the time, the reloadings, because it takes uh, it takes uh, some time to do this. So it's um, I, I I I talked about in the previous talk how we use the de randomization scheme to to have a specific budget of shots and then basically um, have uh, um, have a more clever measurement scheme than just measuring everything a set amount of times you you can cleverly infer um the output and so yeah so we have uh we the the, the advantage are is we have this um basically a good connectivity of our device uh so the atom interacts with a certain range and uh, you can tune you can move them around uh, it's it's very versatile so there are many possibilities of course depending on the shape if you want to address a specific literal atom, that's kind of a challenge. So we're actively working on right now on local ad addressability, where you have a clear path of how to perform it on our device. So it's a matter of time now. Um, of course, I'm not in the hardware side, so I cannot comment exactly uh, what is the state of it is, but it's uh, really something we are all pushing and then we can really um, have uh, more and more flexibility with what we can do. And that comes down to this uh, difference between digital processing that is uh, we typically consider single qubit gates and some entangling gates as C nodes here and that will be on our device uh, locally addressing some atoms but of course the uh, the on our register the atom always interacts you have to think that you you have always actually this interaction so you have to it's very hard to uh, to decouple everything yeah and uh, what we actually have is usually is analog processing this scheme that uh, we have a certain Hamiltonian by which the actual the whole register is evolving and the quantum state, the final quantum state after certain time t will be defined by this evolution. And we have basically two modes after putting our register into shape. We, we can basically select 
um, uh, giving levels of our atoms, some readback levels that are that would implement given interactions. So we can have this Ising mode, having this kind of interaction between uh, the neighboring neutral atoms, or we can have an X Y here um, uh, interaction. So implement different uh, Hamiltonian evolution of our register to to reach different parts of our Hilbert space. And what what we can control is is this uh, time dependent drive amplitude and uh, and detuning. So these two parameters we can change them in time, run them up, run them down, and uh, perform a certain sequence that will uh, create the desired quantum state at the end in our register. And um, so this uh, brings us to the uh, um, yeah the uh, the idea that we can not only separate. Uh, digital and analog uh, circuit, but we need also expo uh, have the mix of two. So actually, this mode of computation is universal, and if you can uh, if implement some digital local rotation, we would have it. We can access the whole Hilbert space. So we are actually actively working right now in how to create. For instance, if we have trouble locally addressing some qubits, yeah, with with the usual, for instance, Rx, Ry, Z. Uh, single qubit rotation gates. If we cannot create exactly, then we maybe create some equivalent, so, so something a bit different that operates maybe on two qubits, and we can combine them somehow in a sequence that will effectively imp implement the right rotation. So it's uh, it, it's it's something we are working on. Meantime, by why while we don't have full local addressability, we can still work on defining the subsets of operation we can do on our device. And then uh, with them build our, our quantum models. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned, this sponsor studio, as you can see, just as a demo, you can really uh, see how you can build this, uh, our, what we actually can do right now, this analog, uh, in analog mode. Um, so this uh, rabbi frequency uh, and, and the detuning the here, we can tune, tune, tune the positions of your atoms putting them closer further from each other and see the amplitudes and the occupations uh, uh, measurements. So you can really understand how it, the, the location of your uh, will if affect the, the end quantum state. And yeah, so try connecting it to it and try playing around. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so we also have, of course, a more, uh, um, with, without this very nice interface, we, our team produced, we also have more like a Jupyter notebook and one where you can just import all the modules and really control very specific things, modify the underlying classes, implement new things. Uh, that's done in this um, in, in our pulse, not pulse too, but pulse that you can also access its public repo and you can really design the pulse sequence you would like that will maybe reach the right state you need so on our device. And after, of course, you, you use a pulse or pulse studio to design the right pulse sequence you want to maybe run it in a, in a real quantum computer. So uh, we actually working on this, uh, very, just like all other companies are doing, for instance, IBM, yeah, with um, the IBM quantum experience, we had, uh, when I worked there, we had this, that you can just submit jobs on the selected uh, QPU and then run them. So this will be a similar idea. You you could get your API keys, you can send your jobs, wait for them in this with this, uh, you can specify the which register, um, which channels, the which passes you would like, and then uh, giving your, your token, uh, you can make the number of runs you want, jobs and uh, recuperate, um, wait for the execution on our uh, device. So that's, uh, something you would you would be able to do, and uh, yeah, we basically want to make it uh, quite accessible. Uh, and yeah, it's the same time we are selling. We are making one maybe uh, accessible online for our clients. So you you if uh, you, you can contact us to, to to think about if you want to use them. Um, yeah, of course, it's not uh, as uh, as as um, so far we uh, have not got it as uh, flexible as uh, in IBM has got it really you anybody can do it so it's a bit uh, challenging for us yeah we need to uh, still uh, to give everyone the whole planet access at any time it's still uh, with the queues etc yeah it's uh, still work in progress basically and uh, about now uh, quantum machine learning more so yeah we, we, we've looked into uh, quantum computing uh, with our neutral atom platform, because I'm going to talk about uh, algorithm that we are trying to run on this platform. So now you have uh, you have just an overview what the, the our machine looks like. 
and more about the theoretical side of things. You, as I, as I always mention, these two books are amazing. So Maria Schulz's book is really, if you read it all, you will have a very good understanding of, um, of all the basic elements you need to understand the uh, top-notch paper in the field. And also more general book if you need some more background on uh, quantum information, quantum computing in general. So I will be also, um, of course, uh, taking some info from these books for my talk. Um, as just a connection to the previous uh, to the previous lecture I've given, we start by uh, just um, you already seen with of course with previous speakers. Um, how we operate in variational approaches. So we have prepared some initial state. Um, and basically in chemistry, just as a comparison, it was always this uh, some particular chemical uh, zero state. So it was sometimes mean field state. It, it, it was um, just a single bit string uh, with electrons occupying, uh, which symbolize occupation of electrons in lowest orbitals. And we, we basically didn't have any data and um, sort of we didn't have any real data embedding in our uh, in, in 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 the algorithms are presented to you so we we just operate in a zero state with some circuit we measure some observables typically uh, at some some list of Pauli operators we measure multiply them together get a scalar output and based on that scalar we define a cost function for, for task at hand and you are using this some sort of a um, classical optimizer that typically, um, depending if you have a noisy expectation and also noisy output, you will have hard time using a, a finer difference in gradients, such as done in LBAGSB and, for instance, uh, the other arguments such as Adam. Yeah, you have this stochastic uh, perturbation uh, uh, algorithm with stochastic gradient and Kobila that is gradient free. So it's always a game or was a game of uh, just figuring out uh, the Hamiltonian, so the Pauli strings you need to measure for chemistry problems and uh, uh, figuring the right optimizer and the U, so the, your quantum circuit. And then the whole game is, of course, was uh, to get to the minimum of your, um, of your cost function as quickly as possible. And so minimizing the energy, not getting trapped in some local minima, um, hopefully not experienced bar in plateau. So you basically have to design your quantum circuit not too deep so it doesn't have too many parameters so it becomes hard to train etc so it's, it's always this game in version approaches to uh, design the right amount of layers in your unitary to to get to the right output so in, in summary previous lecture we just had this uh, all, all everything i presented uh, last lecture were boiled down to getting uh, your cost function basically an energy so hamiltonian you would uh, get the coefficient from a classical software, just run it and you get these integrals. And these, uh, these uh, operators become uh, your typical Pauli strings and you have a list of them to measure. So all, uh, all these approaches in chemistry, variational quantum angles or base boil down to uh, having a list of these Pauli operators, measuring them individually or group them in a in a best way to uh, to simplify if they commute you can group them you can simultaneously um, measure them basically and then you we we had seen that yeah we we were we were having a um, result that was in on our neutral atom qpu that was uh, really challenging but we have a blueprint we have a path to uh, to run vqes and to uh, gradually improve it with by adding this local adjustability etc um, so we have a clear way of making it work in the end. Uh, since on our device, basically the, the hardest part would be to, of course, to uh, reload your registers. So, uh, so you have to really do as little as possible measurements. And in chemistry, typically we have a lot of these power strings, so a lot of operators to measure. And you have to be very clever if you can group them together, if you can uh, use methods such as derandomization as we use for this plot, for instance to get the energies of lithium hydride molecule here. So yeah, that was the challenge. But now, so we switch to QML and in QML, of course, we have, uh, we have to input somehow your data. And instead basically of having your initial state, I'm typically, uh, I'm thinking always of how can I embed my data in a quantum state in the most clever way. And as you see on this plot, we, from the previous talk also, you remember we um, basically have some uh, say you have a vector, a number of elements, number of scalars, and the more simple way you can do it is to input them in uh, your uh, 
circuit angle. So you can input them in your uh, local single qubit rotations, like here X and Z of this plot gets embedded there. And then you can put afterwards uh, some unitary U, any quantum circuit of your desire, and try to uh, um, try to classify here. So here is just an example classification to classify uh, what or to which uh, cluster the, your data corresponds to. And um, typically, so quantum machine learning, yeah, we you, um, <clears throat> you have you embed your data, and the data I've just mentioned was classical. So that's what we are focusing on this talk. It's mainly would be uh, something that is a really much uh, much more practical that industry has is always a classical data. And we try to embed it in the quantum circuit and operate on the quantum uh, uh, level. So it's, it was unitary with quantum circuit on the top of this embedding. And this is this classical uh, data quantum algorithm. So that also are the combination. You can do classical, classical, the classical ML does it for us. You can do quantum data, of course, in class. So, so you operate on, on quantum states in Hilbert space and or the quantum state in Hilbert space and quantum models. So that's these, uh, these two actually is something uh, that is actively being explored. And that's uh, typically where you can maybe show in easier ways quantum advantage. So there is there are, um, the publication on, for instance, uh, how, how can you detect uh, quantum phases of some uh, uh, model is paper by looking of qu on quantum convolution and they they show that you you permit a quantum convolutional neural network you on operating on quantum states so quantum data then you can have um an advan ad an advantage there so but we in industry we typically uh, most uh, crucial problems practical problems are in this area classical uh, quantum um uh, classical other quantum models and and so so this approach is variational yeah and um for tolerant approach if we build finally our if our new platform succeeds we have uh, tolerance we can error correct etc we can basically run already existing uh, algorithm with proven speed up such as uh, uh, hhl to solve linear systems such as ax equals b the problem there sorry for the pixelized uh, image here you have the basically the b a uh, vector being embedded as, for instance, amplitude embedding somehow as some way to embed your data to have this quantum random access memory, so QRAM. And that's really not trivial. There is no uh, way of doing it right now. So we, we kind of could wait, of course, for uh, until the hardware team builds the photo run quantum machine and we can run this and have our speed ups in our classical machine learning approaches by applying just version of hhl or other algorithms that have proven speed ups but we of course cannot wait for it to arrive we now have this whole field of variational method where we can uh, create various uh, combination of quantum circuits that have different symmetries that's uh, invariant to, uh, to some uh, to some uh, um, symmetry operation in your data you you can basically design a very clever variational model uh, that implements a lot of physics and the present small data so you can get the right result uh, without uh, going to big data. Because as you've seen, we have a hard time. I mean, you, you for instance, we are practically we're inputting our data mainly in our gate rotations and you big data, you have as too many basically inputs to input in the circuit. So we don't have enough to simulate basically. And we need to be very clever with our models so we don't want to compete basically with this uh, uh, classical model. We've seen that they're very successful even with chat GPT, yeah? how they can be. So we're not really competing, but we're still exploring this approach where we still think that there is an advantage uh, while we also building uh, our hardware for the full torrent approaches. And more on the practical side, I think you may, may already have a few exercises and uh, seeing Kiskit how it's done. So. I'm just going to introduce you, uh, maybe this frame was already mentioned, but it's, in, it's just something I use in practice in my day-to-day -day work, and it's uh, PyTorch. PyTorch is an amazing framework, to, in my opinion, because it's really easy to understand. It's written in Python first, and there are very clear steps how you can build your pipeline of training machine learning models, be it classical or quantum. You have um, basically always the same steps that you... Uh, create certain uh, you create certain data set uh, you transform your data in a convenient form as tensors basically so pytorch tensors you can you can use the already existing data loaders to efficiently load the large data 
of course, this would be for classical models. The, the, if you cannot load all the data set on your uh, graphical on your graphical processing, so GPU, you can load in batches. Yeah, uh, so that's typically not really uh, not necessary for we don't have such a large amount of data, but it can still still by by uh, for instance, if we have a simulator working in, on quantum simulator written that can run on GPU, we can also do uh, simulations in batches, and that will of course, give us faster results. Batches means like a few few elements done at once. Uh, so the same circuit runs on many different inputs, and then you can you have all, all, the, all the possible solution to all your inputs with one run instead of you running 64 times separately here, yeah? And it's basically done very simple in PyTorch. You can, you can specify your device, you can just create your class of your model, neural network that imports this, you also, you also inherit from, from the module class, and then you you basically build your sequential layers with given number of series. They just fully connected, very famous MLP dense layer with certain number of inputs outputs. You push your nonlinearities in between, and that's you already have your model uh, that you can then uh, basically have a forward pass. So evolve it on the data X, and. Uh, put it on a device so you should never forget in, in this kind of software to uh, def define a device and every tensor everything should be put on the right device so if you have one divided cpu one gpu you will have an error so that's just something uh, you learn <laughs> just be very consistent with these things when you do a development there and then you specify your training function when you just go on to your data elements here you predict you operate with your model on your data and then you compute the loss and then it differentiates or so does automatic differentiation, builds the computational graph. So all the functions, they have this, uh, they're in this computational graph and then can be, um, that's very, uh, it, it's a revolutionary method yeah, for uh, from derivatives that scales very well. And then you basically run it for number of epochs and then you have your trained model. So that's, uh, you're probably very familiar with these things. Let me see the chat. Um, yeah, okay, thanks for the question. Yeah, you can, so please feel free. Uh, if you have any questions, I will try to uh, answer them. I, I'm just putting this chat somewhere in the corner here, so I keep an eye on it. So it's cool, I mean, if you don't feel, uh, um, yeah, feel uh, feel free to ask. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, even if your question you think is too basic or anything, just, just ask, I will try to answer it if I can. Um, so yeah, the number of epochs, basically I always, um, I always think, okay, let's, let's uh, put a certain number in the beginning. If I don't know any, if I, if I just try new code with new model, I just, I just try a uh, reasonable amount of like hundred thousand. So it will depend strongly on your model. A large model will require more epochs. If your large model is very tailored, has a lot of, um, uh, so basically your model implements the functions that are consistent with the symmetries of your data. So it's very tailored, then it will take less epochs. So the more general your model is typically, the more epochs you need. If I run an MLP linear, uh, this linear layers with uh, ReLU, this is very basic thing. On, uh, on any model, on any task you're trying to, for doing regression, you're trying to fit some function, for instance, with this model, it will take a lot of, lot of epochs because it's not specific to this task. So you need to really uh, work on this part, on your class, define different layers that are maybe, uh, maybe translation invariant if you're working with the images. Yeah, you have this convolutional layers that you, they don't, uh, don't care where your cat is, is located in the picture. It will detect the features wherever it's located. So it basically doesn't matter. So this kind of thing is very important if you, need, if you don't want to run too long your training. And, um, and yeah, so here, uh, basically, uh, what I wanted to say is that you see it's very, very nice framework, very easy. You, if you, you just go now, you on this PyTorch website, you install it, peep install PyTorch, you load on your Python environment, you play with it, you can import, you can look at very, yeah, quantum simulator close to, uh, load move are uh, faster on GPU than it's pure. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's um, yeah. This this part um, yeah de depends, of course, if we have uh, a lot. You you move your data uh, a lot between the two. If your uh, for instance, if your code is not very well optimized, you have to do a lot of movements. Maybe you don't need actually GPU. Your CPU will be working better. 
So you always have to just load your data and then do not a lot of movement of data from GPU to CPU, so back and forth. You have to minimize this and then you can exploit GPU more. So that's, uh, yeah. And then, yeah, of course, that is uh, also true. Like when you build this quantum simulator, so we want, basically we have a quantum simulator written in PyTorch and then we can exploit all this. Uh, we can couple our quantum simulator to any uh, code that is written in PyTorch, any machine learning model, hybridize them together. So it's very, becomes incredible to, uh, to, to use. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have this PyQ code, so you can, it's a public, you can go and try and play with it. It's very basic, so it implements really, basically all the quantum operation, all these gates are just tensors, and then you, uh, they combine, so you together to, to create your quantum circuit, which is an end a tensor also, this, your state is a tensor, so you you do only tensor. Uh, um, uh, so you do these operations on tensor, which are very optimized in Torch. You can use all this uh, strong uh, baggage uh, optimization, and then everything is much faster. I mean, for instance, when I worked with IBM's Qiskit, Qiskit is amazing because it's you can just by a change of a keyword run on a device. Yeah, when I worked at IBM, but with this, what we developed at Pascal, we can really run. The, the, very large models very quickly in batches on the gpu if we code well you don't have to uh you you can really exploit gpus very well and for instance we can think about just defining a target function in part of this function you plot it here and we want to fit it so um typically uh yeah Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, was, I meant the move. So the question was, um, uh, yeah, I meant the move or load with relation memory as can uh, data set. Yeah, it's, um, so yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> this, we need, you need, so basically it's always, um, it's always a matter of trying it and see what's, wh where the problems are. So it's, you implement it, you run it, you see if uh, you typically data sets we have, are not too large for the quantum application. You, we try to, we, it's very difficult to work with very large data set and with very num large number of features. That's what I mean also. So it's it's really, um, yeah, not not that big of a deal. We cannot really work with large, uh, like big data really. Um, yeah, so uh, next, so you, to feed that function, yeah, you need certain way of doing it. And you, the simplest way is to prepare your state, initial state, and then you operate with your circuit on it, and then you measure your cost function. As we did in all directional approach, you've seen them probably many, many times now with all the talks. That's that's your output, and then this output basically you you make a difference, a uh, mean square and error between your the data you know, so the ideal function shape y j, and your and your uh, uh, your guess with your your output of your neural network f of theta, the parameters of your circuit here, and the data you input with some embedding. So this circuit, yeah, very basic. We can basically try to fit this curves with some initial, when you, as you initialize your network of what you don't know, so it looks really bad, but then eventually it manages to fit your data. And uh, so we have this in PyQ. You can go there now and, uh, and check how it's done. So you can create a bunch of uh, layers. So uh, the U, U rotation, general three parameter rotation on these three qubits here. And then you have your CNOS connecting those three qubits. So here is not exactly this circuit. I just put you just quickly in general the idea. The it's, a, it's the typical hardware um, efficient circuit that you have. So you general rotation on every qubit. Here is RY would be U instead. And here are some entanglers to uh, to make in, to create to span the whole Hilbert space, hopefully, or some real relevant parts. Usually, it's better if you know, <laughs> and then to measure. And then you can see, I mean, it's uh, basically what you do in PyQ, define again your module as we do in PyTorch, Torch, and then module. You put your uh, number of qubits, and that layer should define on the left with your feature map, the way you embed, and what you use uh, for data. So Rx, the, uh, the, the data X will be embedded in rotation of Rx gates and all the qubits here. And then you basically have a Z observer on zero qubits here. And then you measure the Z observable so that's, that does it here, observable state, new state, that does this expectation value, the last line. So it's very, if you're familiar with PyTorch, you're already very good with it. You can, you can try go here, try to write your models, try to implement maybe different circuits than this, and 
maybe combine with already existing, maybe you already did some coding in Torch, you can combine your layers with this, some quantum layer, even simulated quantum layer, and then see what happens. <laughs> or maybe have some clever idea where can you have an advantage. Of course, uh, initial guess of that uh, QNM we just seen would be bad. So you have this uh, shape. Of course, if you can guess the initial parameters better, it's always it's always it's always great. So this sometimes if you have a complicated problem, not just feeding such a function, but maybe something more complex. You really need a good initial guess and a few works that now say, I mean, the version algorithm are trapped with, this, uh, with traps in the uh, energy landscape. So depending on how you define your loss function, um, it, it can be very hard, not just the gradient will vanish, but just the, the loss landscape would be so wavy that you get trapped somewhere quite easily. So you have to initialize it pretty well. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So QML model runs on an emulator. Emulator can be run on, uh, you can say CPU with a keyword or GPU, and then it will just send on your GPU. As if you have a PC with NVIDIA graphics card, you can you can really run it. So yeah. So then then this is, you see the, the usual training, you define your MSC loss as I showed before. Uh, yeah, have a prediction, MSC loss in the prediction, you do your steps. You select some optimizer, Adam typ typically. Um, yeah, if this um, stochastic gradient base, but you have also other optimizers you can try. Oh, that's uh, one of the one that works best. Yeah, very famous. So. And yeah, so you at the end you will you will have uh, you will have your function uh, fitted perfectly, and you will be happy. Of course, now as you see, we did it all in GPU and simulation. Everything is a tensor. Everything is exactly differentiable. We have exact derivatives. It's all perfect. So there is no noise, nothing as in a real quantum computer. So one step would be to add uh, to add the realistic way of, of differentiating. Here we use automatic differentiating because it's already implemented in uh, PyTorch. But we can also do the the one which we actually would use on the device. Yeah. And that is the parameter shift rule. I mean, the previous talk might have too much have talked about is the very basics of a QML, and it's uh, is good if you memorize it there by heart by now. It's it's the the most important thing, uh, one of the most important thing that you you understand that if you if you just specify an optimizer just BFGS that use numerical gradients, find the differences. It will really, really have hard times, so the gradient will be really bad if you have any noise. And typically, what I was doing, uh, even on real, we runs on IBM devices when I was doing my simulation, was to uh, use a gradient-free optimization. Yeah, so Kobila for me, Kobila was amazing. It worked uh, uh, the best out of everything I tried. They also like more specific optimizer, short base, short frugal. So it's really they are aware that you're running quantum. Uh, algorithm, but for me personally, the Kobila one was uh, if you if you without the without the gradients was the best. So just in case, but yeah. So if you do typically, if you want to train a large model in machine learning, we need it's really hard to train without gradients, and uh, we really need them. And there we can actually get the exact gradient. Luckily, so there is a derivation in Maria Schulz paper and appendix that. It's basically uh, just saying that if so there is a theorem and they're saying if the generator of your gate, so this exponential of i, g, g can be an x, a sigma x, for instance, a Pauli, that you, uh, a single qubit rotation, and it has two eigenvalues, yet g has two, it's minus one plus one. So it's, it follows this uh, theorem, two, uh, two eigenvalues. And then you can ju just do your maths. So it's like a very nice derivation in this paper that you can show that the gradient will actually be exact given these conditions. And you would just need to do base, like find a difference, but with a specific shift. So this is pi over two here. This, if you do this pi over two here, you will get the exact analytic gradient. It looks like finally, but it's not. So it's really analytic gradient, perfect, yeah? But, so we can do it for the uh, G generators of our rotation. So if you have a tensor product of a Pauli operator, it will also be two unique minus one plus one eigenvalues. But what if the generator is something different? It has Hamiltonian with different, with more complicated eigenvalues. Yeah, that can happen easily, on, especially on our device. So we don't have, we don't have fully digital paradigm. We have 
analog uh, operation we can do. So in quantum machine learning, we would need to have sort of equivalent of this theorem for uh, our general, so this analog blocks. And yes, there was a work by the previous uh, lecturer, uh, Sasha Kirienko, uh, uh, extremely useful work because it's really showing you how to do it for any generator. And you can, uh, what basically boils down, having a generator, just a matrix. Yeah, You compute these eigenvalues, you, you compute the difference between, so you get the gaps. And based on those gaps, you can really um, you you can really define uh, then uh, the the with this you can then have a free parameter which is this uh, certain delta. So that, as previously with pi over two here, it is a delta one, delta two. This is these two free parameters that you can still tune. Based on these gaps, you you have this equation above. You can calculate this R by inverting this M matrix. So the, it's like a recipe yeah, to give you analytic gradient for any G. And then you just have to optimize this delta and delta one, delta two. So that's, it assumes here you have, a, you have a more than, more than uh, one distinct. So it's two values, which are, uh, so this um, <clears throat> has these two values of delta. And basically here, as you see for, uh, for, uh, for S equals one, so if there's one gap, such as in typical Pauli RR XRYRZ, for instance, or the, um, you, you have basically the uh, just, just one, S equal one, then it's only pi over two in this relation. But here we have S equals two, an example. And then if you plot the, the, the variance of your gradient that you, you want to have it minimum, it's, dep it's the variance depending on the short noise. So the typically, if you want to measure your gradient well <laughs> on the device, you want to have low variance. So you want to be here somewhere. And that's what happens. So you need to tune. So if you define your uh, non-trivial G, then you have to tune this delta once for your whole circuit to have the optimal minimize the variance. And then you're good to go. You have your analytic gradient with minimized short noise here for this gradient and then you can basically have an equivalent here of this to the general uh, gate. So that's very important yeah because we we know that um we we have algorithms such as quantum Fourier transform okay okay nothing new just looking in the chat yeah um yeah so you as as you know we now have as i said we have this mix we have a mix of, of uh, digital gates and uh, we can have also analog blocks. So we can have two modes of operation. We can have uh, blocks of digital gates where nothing is coupled together, like seen here with my laser is, or here as DAQC. Or there is one where everything uh, interacts all the time and, you add, and, and during this interaction, you have a single qubit gate that appear. So that is these two modes. And for two modes, we have a clear pass by applying the previous PSR, parameter shift rule and general parameter shift rule, where you have this um, analog operation happening all the time. Then you, if by doing this, then you, then you can always train your model with analytic gradient. So that's really good to have, the, at least theoretically, we know how to do it. Now it's all, of course, we, we have in, inside, we have, we, we implementing this parse for, for in our sim in our uh, private simulator, etc. So yeah, um, yeah. So you've seen now that we in our devices we have these two ways of differentiating. But typically in PyTorch, I just something more practical here. How you would do it if you have already knowledge of PyTorch? So it's in SpyQ. You you can also implement yourself there. So that's one uh, good tutorial I found that I also like. I, I like it, it's in Keyskit. It's in Learn Keyskit, and it's explains you how to create your custom model by calling your quantum circuits. So you, you perform this parameter shift rule, the PSR rule, by defining your custom backward pass. So you tell your model how to compute derivatives explicitly. So it, it, it calls to this PSR code here that you see there is this shift. So it's basically uh, this pi over, plus pi over two minus pi over two shifts and you get your analytic gradient as here. That's what this code does basically. So you, you can really uh create more realistic um more realistic simulation of your models by implementing in this way in your quantum uh, model a clear parameter shift rule or general parameter shift rule 
all in Pytorch. So we really like we are, we, uh, right now uh, I'm basically working mostly in in in, in Pytorch for my development. And yeah, so um, as I mentioned, we uh, we we are not really trying to compete with um, with uh, with big data, yeah, with with these things. Um, we are really uh, we are really focused now introducing some uh, ways we from what we know of, of our problem from some symmetries of our data conservation law dynamics. With all these things, we we have some bias, and we the best thing we see I see personally is always to try to. Uh, try to improve our very general model, which is hardware efficient. Uh, if you put yeah, the Q and N, the hardware efficient, and that after your embedding, that probably won't work very well, and you need a lot of data. So you have no physics embedded, but you need really to uh, work on your um, on uh, embedding more knowledge in your model. And what we are, uh, yeah, what we are focused on, as I said, is classical quantum. That's where we are now. Will be our my talk will be more on differential quantum circuits. Uh, it's uh, basically Sasha Kirenga was one of the main uh, developer of this approach, and currently in my work we are really using for very uh, a lot of industrial use cases this approach. So there are many things you can use um, differential equations for, be it for chemical engineering design, uh, designing planes, their shape, um, uh, heat diffusion. So all this application you see here. It's 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 really it's really if you have differential equation you can apply our method so it's really great because many industries have problems that relate to differential equation we can have many clients like this and that's really good to investigate if we can help them by having Q and Ns working on the data that's kind of all these possibilities you have here and you can see that I mean the Navier Stokes field flow equation they are really uh, can be pretty complicated to for a simulation to solve with final elements methods and we we would like to try to solve all these differential questions with our uh, QPU so the one one question is maybe you already you previously actually already seen this yeah but just but how can we do this yeah and this was um, one of one of the challenge with, which was when where DQC showed its promise was this event by Airbus organized that uh, uh, ask, can you solve our problems with uh, neural networks? Uh, uh, can you solve a differential equation? And actually, in, so a quantum challenge, it, in quantum challenge, our algorithm showed uh, uh, very good results. That well, was a, uh, extremely nice to have. You can read about it in this, uh, from these links. And since then, it was, of course, since that success, we tried to uh, really explore the, the most of it. And maybe you've already been shown this, but in the, in the gist of it, yeah, it's uh, basically having your 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 data. You can you can of course use classical neural network or a quantum neural network, a DQC, and I will explain all the components in the following slides again, maybe. So you um you you uh, your um, your your outputs. If you if you want to find the f that satisfies your differential equation, such as here, and some boundary conditions such as this one or initial conditions, yeah, you um. <clears throat> You basically would get this the value of f by running your Q and N or your or your model MLP such as here, and you would do an automatic differentiation or you go employ parameter shift rule or general parameter shift rule to obtain derivatives. Having the value of fx and uh, derivatives, you can see that you can just substitute them inside. Yeah, f of x and the derivatives you can substitute in this equation, and then check if it's in the quality you get and if this condition is satisfied. So that's you see you can see how the loss can be defined from it yeah just this would actually give you a loss on your on your model and how you you would train it you would train this parameter change this and uh, we uh, we basically have a lot of cases we uh, we we exploit um <clears throat> differential equations for uh be it we we found uh, we we fitted some differential equation we also um uh, made some optimization of the uh, so there is also this quantum extremal learning i will talk about and learning actually coefficients of differential equations so this differential models learning so you learn actually this the coefficients in front of every term so it's many different possibilities you can exploit and uh, we are we are, we have all sub teams working on different kinds of uh, and i will go into details of a few of these approaches 
So ju just to uh, to go more detail about this, so so differential quantum circuit, you have a par two parts, and both can be differentiable. Yeah, you can have different differentiable feature map, also, which would be great. Yeah, you can also extremize your your out your output depending on the parameters of here of the input. So that's going to be also great. And then you have your variation quantum circuit that can be any combination of layers that you desire. Yeah. Um, and then um, you have to compute derivative derivatives. You have many evaluations to perform. So uh, this, as I said, um, PSR rule or general PSR rule goes to your help and you use it. You evaluate all your necessary derivatives. And having the derivatives, uh, of course, you need it uh, first to input your data. And uh, that was that is very important. That was what was the gist of the work of Sasha Kirienko in the, in, the, in that publication with uh, Vincent Elfwing. Uh, um, how you embed the data and how how to understand how to best embed your data. Yeah, because you can. It's not just putting them. Your uh, you can't just put your values, your x values of your data. So this x value inside your gate rotations, but. There are also ways to, to actually exploit uh, different basis sets of polynomials, typically Chebyshev polynomials, that will give you different frequencies so that you can fit more efficiently with less a number of qubits uh, your functions. Here, you, if, you, if it's very wiggly, yes, you need more and more perhaps qubits, etc. And, um, and then you, you can do it in a better way, but with a good uh, data embedding, such as a Chebyshev embedding. Um, which is very, very useful in my, in my day to day uh, because I, I can use a typical feature map, which is just angle embedding here in RY, put my, my data here, or I can just, or I can use more clever Chebyshev embedding that, and, and, and have a few variants where I know why I'm, I might have some guarantees of my model working better. And at the end, as you see, in a, your, diff, your form of differential equation will define the loss so the equality with respect to derivatives and the so left-hand side and right-hand side, the equality will define your loss. And you would try, of course, to minimize your loss, getting it to zero value somewhere. And then you would achieve, you can, you can fit your function perfectly if the loss is equal to zero in the end. So you can typically have your loss on derivatives and loss on the boundaries, initial, like, initial boundary conditions of your problem. And that's kind of the gist of the, of the thing. And it works basically, yeah, you can see alive how it fits a given curve. And basically at the end, you, this is pretty s simple curve and it, how it manages to change your model until it matches the, the desired output. So basically here we, we tried for, for this 1D problem, Navier-Stokes um, uh, type problem we had. So that's uh, so in, in the paper by Sasha Kirienko, so maybe has already presented it, but here, um, so that's just the prototypical problem. Uh, um, typically, we study as we join the company. So yeah, here uh, you define the x zero and x one. Uh, so you, you normalize basically your x axis because the the feature the quantum feature map is defined in that domain. So you need to normalize your inputs. Otherwise, it's yeah, it's undefined outside. So that's why it's in that particular range. And then you see how every uh, variable of your Navier-Stokes equation, as you just apply our method with by uh, having a certain DQC and and fitting it and and, and certain boundary condition put in that loss term. So this uh, looks sufficiently complex. You can see how it progresses from the left, how the model initially guesses the and how eventually it improves and how the loss goes to some low value. So, so this is the principle, the, how we, we try to come to our industrial partners and try to take their problem and uh, see what different equation they have and try to improve their results with our models, which, uh, yeah, we try to tailor to giving a problem. And also we have tried different other more uh, uh, complicated problem, not just 1D, but uh, uh, 2D here. Uh, where you have a lid and you have a f f incompressible fluid that is can be moving around and you have um, you have a lid moving in a certain speed to a certain direction and we we wanted to see the flow the direction of this movement by solving uh, the given differential equations 
And it's always this game of um, the, uh, first trying the which number of qubits will work for you, which ends up, so the heuristic ends up. Typically, we would scan for this. We would, uh, you would define boundary conditions for this problem, yeah, and then as soon as you got your loss, you would try to, you try to train some model, and typically, you would start with heuristic, just some hardware-efficient ansatz, and you scale number of qubits to add a few more frequencies. So this, uh, in, in, our, in our Chebyshev embedding, you had extra frequency to have more and more um, capacity to represent the right function. And then you would uh, play with the depths order to span the right amount of the Hilbert space, not too much, not too little. And, in, and usually you would try to uh, use some kind of a scheme of optimization. So you can, for instance, train first with Adam optimizer, uh, stochastic di direction for your gradient, but then you do a full gradient. So you just go in the direction of your gradient with LBFGSB for the fine tuning to get the best results. And typically the cost function in DQC is just, tot I mean, you can use total magnetization. Or oh, so um, you it's basically a linear combination of any Pauli or Pauli string, and you can um, you can basically tune, you can parameterize this linear combination, you can make it trainable too, so you you can make it more and more flexible. So having this problem, we also try different problems such as for this heat flow uh, in this um, <clears throat> in this thermal problem for the heat transfer. You have this uh, equation here that you, you, you want to solve, and you have a conditions, of course, with this equation on the uh, derivatives, a uh, certain temperature of center in the body, and how heat flux goes through it with the temperature here. And here, um, here we, we also tune. So you see it's, again, a hybrid optimizer. So you probably it was used Adam for the initial training, and then finally to the fine tuning to get the best result LDFGSB. The learning rate, that's one important parameter, how, how strong you change your parameters, how, uh, how your step size of your gradient descent is, how big it is. So that will be automatically tuned, but it's optimal, but still you have to define the initial one. It can be really important to set it to very high or very low, very low depending on where, where in optimization, which stage of the training you are. So you see, we, we tried, we work with clients, it's in one of the projects, we tried this and it's uh, pretty successful. And usually you try, of course, to claim when it's, why it's such a good method, why use quantum and typically, yes. I mean, you try to say that you have uh, less parameters available to do the same job as classical. So it's, it's always, I mean, it, it's not that simple to, uh, to, to, ha to say why, why you should use quantum here and not classical. Um, and now, and now we're going to switch to something a bit different. So for a change from DQC, we might have heard already before. Now we'll be about graphs. That's something um, in uh, geometric deep learning um, that you basically, you, we, we want to work with graphs. And we, we've seen that we have a very uh, strong capacity, as you see, to, to do any 3D shape of our register we want and we can represent in, th in three dimensions our graphs and try to do graph machine learning uh, with with the shapes of our register, etc. So that's the idea. We have a clear analogy between a, a register and a graph. And actually, I mean, we, we kind of shown that it's a good idea and that it works. There is this paper on quantum evolution kernel. And uh, in that paper, we basically embed a uh, graph in that uh, 3D or 2D. I think it's it, here we started with 2D embedding. So it's 2D, the graph in two dimensions. And uh, then what we want to do is kernel. So kernel, basically, the idea is you have a data set. If you have, if you have it linearly separable yeah, in your uh, original space, it's easy. You can just fit a plane. And then you know which, if you have a new data point, which category uh, blue or uh, orange uh, it corresponds to. Yeah, but if you have more complex uh, shape, then you cannot fit a plane. You have to go into some other higher dimension, for instance, to fit a hyperplane. So that's uh, you already heard from previous lecture. Basic idea of a kernel, and then you want to do something similar with graphs. So you might think if you represent the graph with a quantum state on our QPU by embedding the graph directly as, uh, so this becomes, uh, this becomes the register, the register shape, basically, let's say for simplicity, then you can, you are in this feature addition, you have this additional dimensions 
and you might distinguish uh, compare graphs with uh, in in a better way. So that was that was the idea to to make a kernel where we can compare graphs and do, draw see the similarity between different graphs. Here, as we had a graph, we embedded in our as a register. So you have a physically this neutral atoms sitting in some location according to the shape and then in between we have these pulses intervening to modify the quantum state to improve our kernel for instance and so you have this uh, final set of your registers this uh, psi final so you apply all your uh, sequence of um, single like single qubit rotations for instance then you evolve certain time with your so you just let your register evolve you don't do for instance maybe anything uh, or you shine, you drive it with some frequency or the whole global pulse. And so you, you do some operations and you uh, you make it with a graph, Hamiltonian, and then you measure. So what you measure is uh, you, you measure the occupation of every site. And then you can basically, um, <clears throat> you, you, can, you, you can detect what the state, the bit string is corresponding to yeah, of, this, uh, of this graph. So the quantum state of your register having this, well, so if you have five qubits, let's say you have five, five, this kind of quantum state output, zero, one, one, zero. So it's clear. And you know how we can measure expectation value. I have shown you in the previous talk how you can, from this result, just by doing many, many repetitions, infer probabilities, and from the eigenvalues of your operators, probably you can infer then the expectation value, so measurement of some operator. So... <clears throat> Here, for instance, what we did, yeah, was to measure these probabilities and use and compare the two probability distributions from uh, from two different graphs. So you run your, you embed your graphs in your quantum computer, you detect, you detect your state many times, then you upload a different graph inside, you do the same, you have two probability distributions, and you use some metric of probability distribution to compare them together, and that's, again, since uh, Shannon divergence here, um and then you have the definitions of uh, um entropy and then you you can basically you see that uh, um if 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 um max maximal uh it's zero if that this the graph will be the same and uh, maximal if they're not so that was the idea here also that we we compare all these graphs in this plot we run them in our simulator first. That was done all, I think, in the, so we actually done in PyQ. It was done in a torch environment, uh, embedding these graphs. Um, <clears throat> for instance, we, we can, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think, it, yeah, this is done in simulation and then we can compare and see whether we have um, this similar graph or not. Zero, very similar. So zero, graph zero, graph zero, of course, very similar. Diagonal are zero, but other ones are very different. Uh, you can distinguish them well. So we can manually create graphs that are uh, very distinct, yeah, and we can see if the kernel actually works or not with these numbers. If it's high, they, they, if we know exactly this, they're, ex they're very different, so these numbers are correct. And you can see that this occupation, basically, of, um, of uh, your... Uh, your state is evolving differently, so you have to wait a certain amount to see for different graphs uh, so to distinguish, you have to wait a certain time until there is some dynamics happens of your quantum state. Your quantum state is right now, so you can distinguish. Uh, so there is like a certain time at which you stop your quantum computer and you uh, you measure your probability distribution. And there is these good times here, and there are some times when they, nothing interesting happens. And then what we did was doing this, of course, on a real QPU, which was pretty exciting. Yeah, then uh, uh, let's try to do it because. Uh, um, as as you notice, I mean, we it's kind of if you put in any shape your neutral atom in your in your QPU, then to address them locally is very hard. You can imagine shining laser on some hidden atom in between the other two. It can you it, it can be fairly trying to locally address uh, uh, if you have a lot of neutral atoms. Yeah. So the approach of of using kernels, so implementing uh, kernels on the new, on our platform is the most the cleverest because then you you just need to uh somehow embed your data let the system evolve and then you can implement your kernel and the way they did it here was also loading in the batch basically two graphs at the same time and measuring the same similar matrix that we've seen before and uh, trying to distinguish difficult cases of these graphs 
there are graphs like this, these two, which are classically hard to distinguish, and our quantum kernel. So if you embed the this graph in the Hamiltonian, and you just involve your quantum state and measure the occupation number, then you see for um, basically for one uh, for uh, one one for one graph is is different. So the yellow graph evolves differently than to the um, this other graph G one. That means that if you measure this uh, uh, JS divergence, yeah, so you measure your probability distribution for separately to the graphs, they will be distinguished fairly easily, which is not a given for classical uh, model, classical kernels. Of course, you can tailor your kernel, yeah, but typically this is not an easy task. So the quantum at least shows if the dynamics according to this graph that they are fairly distinguishable. And we did it in experiment and we compared it with simulation, which was pretty in, in uh, enough uh, sufficient agreement. Um, yeah, and uh, I want to approach to the uh, other part of the talk, which is now we are back more to the differential circuits part, the circuit learning is quantum extremal learning. So uh, it's uh, we in, in this in this uh, learning task, we try to extremize now the to, towards the input. So for instance, you have you have a plane, you, you have your Navier-Stokes equation of the airflow around your plane, yeah, and you want to optimize the shape that the airflow is perfect and uh, you have your best plane possible. So you optimize geometry of this plane and geometry, of course, will be the input of your uh, uh, differential equation somehow and you would want to change this input to, to get to a better, to a, actually a better plane shape. So we have many classical models and here uh, in this paper, so there is, um, we did some work on this and we actually implemented this quantum version. So how to use quantum circuits to do this extremization. And yeah, so the, the, the principle is very simple. So if you have your inputs, you have uh, extension D, this extension of a plane for one single parameter you can tune. Uh, you could uh, train this model, yeah. And then you, you would at the end freeze the train mod, train network side, and you just would optimize the D parameter. So basically optimizing the feature map parameter to find the minimum to, so the optimal width of this plane. And so we, we did something in that area. So uh, Savas uh, um, in our team uh, worked out this paper where he basically implement this idea in continuous and discrete case. So that you basically input your data with a feature map, have a cost uh, Q and N and observable, and that you basically train it, uh, the, your regression model with some, you that you can differentiate, of course you have to differentiate with respect to input. So your feature map has to be differentiable of kind and your uh, cost Q and N too. So you compute the derivatives, you, you satisfy, um, you can solve your uh, DQC problem, but then you have to also extremize with respect to feature maps so you can, freeze one part so the cost q and n part and you would change the feature map now so that you can uh, basically improve uh, um, over the inputs and find the right um, configuration for that parameter that you're trying to optimize for your problem so here uh, just to demonstrate what was done yeah it was done uh, this um, for this uh, wing um, 2d case here with a flow of wind yeah so that's uh, this uh, Navier-Stokes equation and being solved. And uh, you can see that different shape, different uh, uh, stages of the training. And there is one particular uh, hyperparameter of this uh, wing that worked the best, that optimized the best, uh, the shape. And um, <clears throat> you see that it was, uh, depending on the number of features, you use different number of qubits per feature and you you also the optimizer here was a bit of a different one it was not the usual adam plus lbfdsb so it had to be tuned in this case and as always you you when you when you approach this new problem you use uh, some D, general dqc heuristic comes out with fixed number of layers that you tune uh you you try to ramp up the number of qubits until it works until you get to maybe to the known correct shape of this wing and then you can you you can basically um know uh, ideally or you you basically could also what you do you can change your parameters you can increase number of qubits you to have more uh, expressive uh, model and also increase the depth until it 
the hyperparameter won't change. Yeah, so that's another way you can approach this. So you don't have to. Um, you can see that the basically you have converged the model. Yeah, and so I wanted to now to start to approach to an end of this talk. So I um, we've seen a, a lot of things now. And um, one of the things which uh, in, uh, in, in kernel meta that was recently shown that there was this problem of uh, exponential concentration that the, the, the quantum kernels are um, not problematic. And um, how can we overcome this? So they, they are not practical when you scale them up. And then uh, uh, we don't know yet the open questions such as if that kernel uh, does suffer from it. That's one thing about kernels. Of course, I'm I'm putting here a kernel base. I haven't touched the kernel base, partial differential equation solvers, or that we also have um, have that patented. And um, yeah, um, the other side of things is that in my in general in um, in my work, yeah, this there are these Q and Ns, and every Q and N has to be uh, basically. Um, can be designed heuristically by, uh, for instance, uh, gradually building QNN by adding layer by layer, seeing which layer adds uh, uh, better um, fitting of your target data and uh, generalizes better. Um, but you can also, what you can do is uh, <clears throat> look at the symmetries, yeah? Look at the symmetries of your data. If it has symmetry, there is now a, a quite uh, important development in that field in equivalent uh, quantum neural networks. So just saying that embedding symmetries with respect to your data. So if you if you apply a symmetry operation to your data, um, that your output of your model won't change. So that's that's was shown that it's really um, really improves all 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 problems. So it suppresses all problems. So it's uh, it becomes uh, enough expressive, it's trainable, and then so over parameter is achieved very quickly. So you don't need very a lot of layers to to get good generalization, for instance. Yeah. Um, so we are now working on these things, and I am actually yeah, I'm investigating these things, what we can do in our device. And one of the things, yeah, one of these papers is I, I really liked it. It's something yeah, you might want to look at uh, and some others. By just uh, giving a symmetry, so a permutation symmetry of your input uh, is permutationally symmetric. So that if you so swap two, it doesn't output doesn't change. You have all the theoretical guarantees that, as I just mentioned, that are satisfied. So no barring plateaus and etc. So it sounds very good. And in this paper, they explain what is the difficulty. Yeah, because your embedding has to be a covariant. So it cannot be any embedding. It's going to be very particular is also a covariant. Your quantum model has to also respect the symmetries and your output, the way you measure in our DQC, so the total magnetization has to be also a covariant according to the symmetry group of your data. So everything has to be respecting the symmetries and if one does not, these guarantees are not anymore uh, guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> so these cool things uh, we cannot have anymore. And uh, recently was this paper on the covariant quantum circuit for learning and weighted graphs when they try to learn a soft travel salesman problem on a graph. They upload the graph on the state and they want a sequence of nodes that you, your, your travel salesperson wants to explore in a sequence. Yeah. And then what they showed, I mean, one of the interesting results that was also the first question is what happens if you, if in your models you break the symmetry slightly? So this equivalent result, the basically approximation ratio was really good. So let's say this is the best they obtained for this problem. But then if you break the symmetry slightly with uh, this, um, uh, ha so this hardware efficient, uh, so they, this, they, for instance, one parameter becomes independent. So it breaks slightly. So usually in the equivalent circuits, parameters are dependent. So they don't break the symmetries. But if you if you make them independent just to break a bit the symmetry, let's say in some gates in your circuit, they showed here is basically this all this uh, compared to round almost to random and are very efficient. They almost random sometimes is even better. Yeah, random circuit, uh, random and that. So it's really that it's quite sensitive, uh, and uh, they say that in that paper that you really need to uh, think about similarly if you want to train some uh, significant size quantum neural network 
Um, otherwise, for toy problems, your small one, small heuristic uh, neural might work. But when you scale it up, then later you have they have some incident they didn't manage to train it, so they re- say in the text, and that's um, the direction I think of um, really this in our noisy era when we have fault tolerance. What we can do is tailor really these models. And we see in classical machine learning, yeah, with these uh, transformers models, yeah, that they are so good because they, they, they're not just MLP, they're really interesting combination with attention, et cetera. So they really interesting uh, functions in the end uh, that they implement. And we also need to work on this in quantum rare, I feel. And yeah, that's, uh, that's it on, uh, on the talk. I wanted to thank uh, all the people that were involved in all the papers, so this uh, Vincent and Ale- Alexander Kiyenko just presented, and others from uh, my team, with Louis Paul Henry, and the others uh, in Paris, uh, and also the uh, algorithm team here in, uh, in Amsterdam I'm working with. So uh, the, pap- the papers I present, maybe I haven't put the reference, which I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so the work I presented was basically the w- main works of our team, one of the main works, yeah. So I would like to thank you all for the list for being staying with me for this long talk. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, and please any questions uh, if you'd like to, uh, some more understanding, I can go. I can try to help you. And uh, yeah, please uh, yeah contact us. Uh, look at our career page if you uh, think about the career. If you have already some knowledge. Um, internships you can send me or uh, our manager Vincent an email if you if you yeah if you feel you're confident you you have strong background. During evolution of the system, from classical machine learning in terms of speed. Okay, can quantum extremal learning algorithm outperform classical machine learning in terms of speed of accuracy? So, so this part is unclear. Yeah, so it always depends on the specific specificity of the problem, and you may be able to tailor to some particular problem your quantum model. In general, it's very hard to say yes. I would say you can show it, but I cannot. I would. I. I. I we. I cannot confidently say that we have this one that cannot be beaten by classical. So that's uh, unfortunately I cannot say. Um, and sorry, just try to score. How, how can graphs be used to understand the effects of quantum error that occur during the evolution of quantum system on the result of computation? Hmm. Head of quantum error that occurred during the evolution. Of... So you, you, you could, <laughs> I don't know, like if you want to understand some errors, you can build some graph based. Uh, uh, model that you input your register in your classical graph neural network yeah, and you try to error correct error mitigate based on this the features of it because you know these features of your graph you may try to create your model it might be an idea but yeah uh, other than this i don't know uh, what uh, how to answer yeah that's uh, you you can this you can try to design such a model like a graph based model if i does part of your work with any ukraine university email I think it should work with any university email. It should be work with Ukrainians. I can even maybe after this, I can ask uh, um, our developers to maybe add uh, your email. Uh, uh, sorry, Ukrainian emails of universities will be accepted. So you can try it. I can ask this uh, actually after this. What do we think about perspectives of using qubits instead of qubits? Thanks. Um, yeah, so this... Uh, Basically, I have a really, really. I haven't worked much with with this. It's uh, it's an interesting uh, topic. We actually in IBM when I was there, we we investigated this direction. Um, here, I'm not. I'm not really. I haven't dug, dug into, so I cannot comment. I cannot give you anything, any useful comment on this. Sorry <laughs> about QDITs. Can we use classical model and quantum model on the same? Uh, can we use classical model and quantum model on the same data set and compare? There is yes, of course you can. For example, on this, yeah, exactly. So uh, exactly this. So CNN, QCNN. There are many, many papers now that do this. So they implement their version of convolution in quantum. One, uh, one which is if you look up looking, looking and QCNN looking, you will find a Nature publication, Nature Physics. And identify quantum phases with quantum. So the data is quantum states, so it's quantum data. Then they show advantage of using quantum CNN, but you can do uh, also apply classical data, of course, to simulate QNN. 
you can embed, for instance, data in some rotation that I've shown you and then implement some similar layout to, uh, to uh, this uh, Lukin's paper from layout of your his QCNN, yeah, and you can compare. So um, it's very easy. In Python, you can really, what you need, you just define that model class. But if you, if you have to implement, you want to try yourself, you just change these layers of the model. <laughs> so yeah, it would be really easy to do that if you, um, especially in PyQ, yeah, it's all PyTorch, so yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So we, we still have, yeah, 10 minutes, yeah, well, it's... Uh, so, yeah, if you have more questions, you can ask. Remember that right now also, um, you can also raise question, um, raise hands and ask question vocally. If there is some complicated topic. Mm -hmm. Might be easier, yeah. <laughs> okay, we have 59 participants. Yeah, I'm so I'm, uh, yeah, it was, it was a very dense talk. Oh, I hope uh, yeah. things were, uh, some things yeah, were clear, is... maybe some unclear, yeah. <laughs> Let me yes, know. I think you, you can unmute yourself right now. So, Nazar, yes. uh, I want uh, to know about Pulsar Studio what type of measurements we can do. Maybe I missed something to tell you. Um, yeah, you can, uh, I think you can measure only in, in the occupation in, in that basis. You can measure. I'm not sure you can do, I have to check. I'm not sure you can do others uh, because you have to do local rotation yet to rotate to any basis or all the qubits. So that's, uh, I think it implements the, the our process studio might implement two modes. So we try to make it like very device, close to device and one which is more flexible. So local disability uh, right now, uh, full loader is not possible so that you, you cannot do uh, all uh, measurement on all basis as you want. So typically, yeah, that's a uh, um, yeah, limitation for a moment. So that's like the active thing. We are all uh, in hardware. They are all pushing uh, towards, uh, we're all telling them local addressability, please. <laughs> and then we can do all the basis uh, uh, measurements. Yeah. Okay. Yuri, yes, yes, Yuri, you can. You can ask. Uh, maybe I missed this at the beginning, but uh, can you tell something about uh, how actually you, uh, do you implement uh, quantum uh -huh. gates uh, on your chips and computers? Ah, so it's um, uh, so by interacting with photons, yeah, basically layer uh, lasers, yeah, shining on our uh, atoms locally or a laser field, yeah, being uh, so. I'm not, of course, um, I'm I'm not working on hardware. I can explain all these nitty gritty details of how it all works there. So I'm more uh, of a, I'm only team on simulation and working with exact simulators, even. Uh, uh, before and in my previous job, I was working with more with noise and more with realistic things on uh, on superconducting chips. Now I'm a bit remote from the QPU, but I'm going to. But yeah, so um, yes, so far is just uh, as you as I've shown you here. Yes, this laser field being shown like this onto your uh, register, and we're trying to implement some kind of uh, SLMs, etc. Component necessary to address locally these uh, these atoms, so that you can do your local operations or two local or three local, yeah. So, so that's op optical access, yes, yeah, like this. I hope it answers your question. <laughs> and and then you of course you you change the parameters of your pulse. So as I said, you you play with the drive amplitude of your laser and detuning, so the parameters of laser field, and then you can uh, drive differently, basically your uh, your diff your uh, register. 
So apply different Hamiltonian basically on on your uh, on your uh, register. <clears throat> Sorry, what so, maximum? Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, what? So what? Uh, uh, sorry, may I uh, ask uh, the second part of my question? Uh, what uh, was the actual actual physical parameter uh, which represents uh, a qubit? A state of an atom? Yes, exactly. It's a state of an atom. You will choose a very two particular read this Rydberg states. And or some other states of, of your choosing you know, of these atoms, and such that the you, you design this, this interaction is strong enough. This C six will depend on the nature of your uh, system, yes, of your atom. Then that's why you have a choice of these particular atoms, yeah, that are very have a very they can couple well in certain range in this Rydberg blockade range, and then uh, you can you can basically make interactions and not interaction that you separate them more than this read read, read the range uh Rydberg range so that's um that's how you you your qubit is implemented with this level with this, some selected quantum states of these individual atoms so you select um de de depending on some parameters yeah so Sergei, you may ask a question uh, thank you. What's the maximum temperature for a quantum computer now? Well, so so this uh, really here uh, I don't recall in the exact number. Yeah. So this <laughs> sorry, it's a vacuum system. So here, uh, yeah, uh, exact temperature I wouldn't I wouldn't know. So uh, on the on the hardware side, I cannot really um, address much of your uh, concerns. I guess more on detail and parameters of these things because I'm not. Uh, um, actually, yeah, operating these things. Uh, um, it's more if you have uh, on algorithm side. That's uh, I'm, I'm, I was just to present you the global uh, picture. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much. Sorry, <laughs> if I cannot cannot give the characteristics of the like, exact thing, that would be really hard. I haven't got under my <laughs> just yeah, front of me the details of these machines. But they are available. Yeah, these these things are published online. I think there is one of this one of our papers. If you if you just Google uh, Pascal, Google on Scholar, any of our papers, you would have all these details uh, in appendices, um, and you would know what's going on precisely. If that's the question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Do we have more questions? Yes, we have. Um, second, uh, uh, okay, Aniket. Right now, you can Aniket. You can uh, speak. Uh, am I audible? We okay. can. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was reading a paper uh, as you mentioned regarding uh, the TSP in uh, uh, graph based. Uh, uh huh. So I was reading a paper yesterday regarding TSP uh, in which uh, the, uh, the author suggested that instead of using uh, 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 cir uh, quantum circuit based uh, uh, models, uh, the ones we are using here, uh, they used quantum annealing. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, is, there, uh, is there a benefit of using quantum annealing in them or we can use the gate based um i guess yeah you can use as a quantum anneal or a machine build of all the hamiltonian uh, with the right parameters until you reach uh, so depending on your spiritual gap if you need to reach the certain ground state certain state that will solve your problem yeah you you can do it i'm based i'm not personally has have been uh, active in uh, in uh, trying to uh, use it as a annealer for this graph but you you probably can do it, and something probably we are my one of the sub team is investigated a bit. Um, yeah, I, I'm not involved, but it's yeah, it's certainly possible. I think on that device. Thank you. I hope this a bit a bit answers the question. And yeah, I have another one I can see in the chat here. What type of qualification background do you want to offer for an internship in quantum related field? Any so fresh? Yeah, for yeah. So I mean. If if you um 
yeah if you have some already some experience of course if it's if it's completely fresh you can still up you can still apply you can send us a cv motivation letter maybe you're very <laughs> who know maybe you're super bright and you can pick it up we have a few uh, extremely good students sometimes they can just do uh, almost uh, our job uh, as good yeah because we can teach uh, very quickly and routine it's uh yeah if uh, if you can show your skills or you need uh I need. I mean, it would be great if you, if, of course, doing just Kiski textbooks, uh, for instance. So all this software, you have, all these uh, tutorials you have online available is great. You, yeah, you need. Of course, always great to have some experience, but you may try to apply and then show that your interest, show your skills with Python, for instance. If you have Python skills, you love programming. Maybe you are not yet Quan, but maybe you are a very gifted coder. That's also a very good skill in our field. Because we have all this software, it's still uh, always evolving, always changing, and we redesign, refactor all the time something. So, if you if you if you like this type of work, you can also not just for uh, like quantum algorithm research or hardware, you can also do software with us. Yeah, so just purely software work without even understanding the quantum, but you will understand with time, of course, because you're gonna ask questions. So there, there, are, there are options, of course, the more the better. So typically you, you can for sure get if you have a, a master's degree, yeah, and you have few, few uh, basically experiences, interests, or internship. you've done something before, you can for sure get something interesting and even get a job after, yeah. So you have already a master. You need to even have a PhD, I think, with us to, to get maybe we're experimenting with this, but... Uh, yeah, so maybe as we expand, it will be not possible anymore. But in the beginning, we even hired, like we have master students, uh, fresh after masters working. And uh, they might get even hired then because they learn all the, the part of a new team. Then they very, like, we can teach them everything and then they can do the work. So, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> That's on the side. So try, yeah, try. Send the CV. We will see if uh, CV motivation is good. Then we can, uh, yeah, we can proceed the interview, etc. <laughs> Usual. But yeah, of course, if you are yeah, just just do try do your master. You can do master in quantum computing nowadays. And if you do master in quantum computing, plus you do uh, some all of these tutorials so that are available, you will be so well prepared for this. Um, if you like this field, you, if you do that, you will be, you have a huge market. So far, there are lots of companies to hiring. So <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, you can try us. So try, try Pascal, <laughs> please. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me know more questions. I guess it's. Uh... So yeah, uh, I think there is no more question, as I can see. So yeah. I would like to I would like to say a big thank you to Igor for your great lecture. It was it was really a pleasure to listen like for the whole discussion. It was it was great. Thank you very much for both of the lectures and for your contribution to the to the school. Thank yeah, you. happy to do so. Thanks, Anton. Uh, thanks for organizing. <laughs> very well done. I will. Thanks. Yeah, I should I should advertise these things more on LinkedIn and. <laughs> mm -hmm me yeah um super so yeah yeah thanks a lot to everyone too yeah it was uh, fun to have such a big uh, yeah 60 people or so or more i don't know <laughs> quite a lot of people <laughs> for, for me thank you yeah yes yeah, it's, it's good so thanks again have a great day eager if anyone just don't, don't hesitate to contact our lecture and to ask some questions and to try internships of course because it's it's really important to do and to work and to gain the experience so don't be shy that's the most important thing you have to know exactly so yeah thank you have a great day bye bye everyone thanks a lot bye bye